Welcome to the library of the Institute for Human Sciences uh, in Vienna. My name is Ivan Vejvoda. I'm a permanent fellow here and I head the Europe's Futures project. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, to present today uh, one of the Europe's Futures fellows, Julia de Klerk Saxe, who is with us and who will uh, give us a talk about really how does Europe present itself how can Europe better describe what it's about and uh, bring in more emotions, if I can put it very simply. Um, in the famous uh, words of the singer Bono, uh, the uh, Europe has to become a feeling. Uh, but this is an age old uh, discussion that has been going on and philosophers have talked about it. Some of you who are old enough or are into political theory and philosophy know that the idea of constitutional patriotism came about as a counterpart or contrary to uh, nationalistic or chauvinistic feelings. But uh, as uh, Ernst Bloch, the German philosopher said, it's hard to mobilize on uh, cold ideas such as a constitution or paper ideas, whereas uh, to rally around the flag or mobilize people about national emotions is easier. And this has been one of the challenging issues that Europe has had to confront. This is an issue that Julia de Klerk is working on. And before I give her the floor, let me just very briefly say that uh, Julia is uh, currently working on a project at Oxford University that tackles exactly this, uh, these issues. She is also a senior non-resident fellow with uh, my former home, the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And uh, previously for many years, she was uh, a, a speechwriter and a senior advisor to the high representatives on foreign and security policy in the European Union with uh, Catherine Ashton and then with uh, Federica Mogherini. She is speaking to us from Brussels today. Uh, we are in Vienna. Many of you are in different cities of Europe and uh, some of us are also in New York. This is the first day uh, in Vienna of a very strict lockdown with an all day curfew. Uh, but we are still able to speak from the library uh, of the Institute for Human Sciences, given uh, special dispensations. So having said all that, Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ivan, for, for this very kind uh, introduction and also for having me in, in your beautiful library again, um, if only virtually. It's, it's really a, a great pleasure to, to be here with all of you. Although I must say it's, it's also a little bit sad that it's already the, the concluding lecture of, of this series, which has really been uh, incredibly inspiring and, and enriching. And so I, I very much look forward to also more, more exchanges uh, throughout the rest of this fellowship. Um, you already mentioned it. I'm gonna talk today to you about this question of how do we tell the story of Europe and, and why does it matter? Um, uh, again, you also already said that, of course, this is an age-old question, right? From the very beginning of, of the Union, or what was then the European Coal and Steel Community, uh, the idea of, of a narrative to drive the process of integration, and also, in a way, to provide um, uh, something that European citizens could identify with, was seen as, as really essential by, by policymakers and, of course, by, by journalists and, and academics. Um, that have looked at this issue. Um, but then for, for many decades, this idea of a, of a narrative really um, receded a bit into the background as, as European integration was seen as something that was mostly a technical issue, something that was decided by heads of state and government and then implemented by um, faceless bureaucrats in, in Brussels, basically. But, um, but of course, the more uh, political power um, the European Union gained, the, the more this kind of idea of, of a narrative came to the fore again. And, and of course, you, you mentioned, Ivan, also this idea of a constitutional patriotism. Now, I wrote my PhD many, many years ago uh, about Habermas and this idea of uh, 
the, the Convention on the Future of Europe, where, of course, uh, the European Union was to have its own Philadelphia, if you will, the sort of founding moment. Um, and of course, that in many ways uh, catastrophically failed, right? That was supposed to be a sort of identity giving moment that was supposed to shift the narrative to more from a sort of more technical issue to, to more, as you said, one of nation making uh, and, and that was, was rejected. Um, and, and then since then, the, the European Union has, has been through, through a number of crises where, where also the narrative in itself uh, was contested more and more. And, and what I argue is that in, in this particular moment right now, we're again at a point of time where the narrative is really essential to, to the survival of the European Union. And, and lest that sound a, a little bit dramatic, uh, let, me, let me briefly outline why, why I would make that case. Um, I think we're again at a moment now uh, or really maybe for the first time where the European Union is contested both from the inside, so we've seen the rise of, of populist movements that uh, question the, the purpose of, of European integration, but also liberal democracy much more generally. And at the same time, we're also at a moment of, of really uh, high level geopolitical competition on contestation, where, where outside powers um, not just question the, the, the influence or push back against the influence of the European Union in its neighborhood. We discussed that at length, of course, we, we talked a lot about the Balkans uh, in its hard power, um, but also in order to undermine the power of the European Union, also interfere really directly in its, its domestic affairs as well. And um, I, I think what we've seen is that uh, this sort of geopolitical competition has moved also into the space directly of, of communication. So um, uh, both China and Russia have, have really uh, moved into the, the information space to contest the project of, of European integration. And so we find ourselves in what my former boss, Josep Borre, the high representative of the European Union, has called a battle of the narratives. So geopolitical competition is actually playing out in, in the narrative itself. Uh, and, and winning that battle in, in many ways will be decisive also for, for the future of the world order that we're, we're going to see. And now add to the, all that mix uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which, which makes this of quest for a compelling narrative uh, even more pressing for the European Union for, for two reasons. On one hand, because as in many ways, uh, COVID has, has kind of highlighted and further accelerated uh, trends that were already there. So it's deepened geopolitical competition. It's hardened the fronts, if you will, uh, between the two poles. But at the same time, of course, also COVID has become a turf in the battle of narratives itself. So um, in our very first lecture, actually, in the series, we talked about how in the Balkans, China has portrayed itself at, and one hand shown that, that the sort of tried to show that the EU is inefficient at coming to the rescue of its, in its own member states and citizens, but also its partners. And then it's really China that's kind of practiced no longer just a checkbook diplomacy, but also uh, a sort of health diplomacy and, and portrayed itself as, as the power that um, is really much more effective and efficient at, at battling this, um, this crisis. Um, and, and another fact is, of course, that the, the political and the economic uncertainty that, that results from the crisis, from the COVID pandemic, makes people much more perceptive to this kind of info wars, to disinformation. And at the same time, it also um, deepens this really already very pervasive sense of fragility, of vulnerability that people feel throughout Europe, through, throughout the world in many ways. Um, and I think what we're seeing is, is something, a sort of trend that we've seen over the past decades is that interdependence really isn't, um, isn't just something that breeds prosperity and peace, it also makes you much more vulnerable, right? Um, and um, it's this sort of vulnerability uh, that, that we've seen tested now. I mean, first I'd say with the, with the financial crisis, uh, then um, with, uh, with the large scale migration and the controversies that, that caused, and now of course the, the COVID pandemic. So if you will, uh, these, these successive crises have gone to the very core um, 
of what citizens care about, right? It's about the money in their pockets. It's about their identity, who they are, what is Europe about? And now it's about their lives. So these are really quite, quite essential questions there. And that therefore I would argue that it's, it's really important at this moment of heightened geopolitical competition and extreme feelings of vulnerability to, um, to take that into account and to really have a narrative that, that um, speaks to these fears and, and also shows a sort of a sense of compassion. You mentioned feelings there and understanding and, and gives hope for the future. I'd also say that this is um, in, in some ways a moment of opportunity for the European Union. Um, a, because there is this sort of sense that the, the things will have to be done differently. The pandemic has highlighted that. And of course, we've just had uh, elections in, in the United States and we now have a, a president elect in the, um, in the United States that is um, a keen transatlanticist that's really keen to reach out to Europeans. And so there is an opportunity there for Europeans to also portray themselves as a, uh, as a powerful political actor geopolitically and, and a potent ally in this, uh, this war of words, if you will. Um, now, the, the challenge is, of course, that uh, the European Union is, is notoriously uh, being criticized for being bad at projecting itself, right? So the, the story goes that it's, it's too out of touch, it's far away from citizens, it's uh, very technocratic, uh, and it's simply too dull, right? It's, it's boring. Um, so the, the EU doesn't really have um, a very good rep when it comes to, to projecting itself and, and projecting a positive image of itself. At, at the same time, though, I would argue that so, so many people have then said well, we need a new narrative. Everything's changing in the world at this time. We also need a new narrative of the, for the European Union. And, and that may be true, but what I would argue is that we don't really need to start from, from scratch in such a new narrative. So if you look uh, on one hand at opinion polls, I think most Europeans, even in this time of doom and gloom, believe that European integration is really crucial. Uh, to getting out of this crisis, to getting out of the, the health the pandemic, but also the economic crisis that uh, is already upon us, but it is most likely uh, to deepen much more. And at the same time, the, the political priorities that the union has set for itself very much reflect the, the political priorities, the top priorities that citizens um, also have. So take the, the, the Green Deal, the European Green Deal, climate change, the European Union for decades has been at the vanguard for, for climate, fighting climate change. And um, by sort of making, tying the, the economic recovery from COVID also to more sustainable and, and a greener economy, it's really tapped into what the public also wants. I think there was a fear at the beginning of the crisis. We've had many discussions um, about this maybe going on a, on a back burner uh, as, as the economic recovery. Uh, moves to the fore, but climate change really remains a, a top priority for, for EU citizens. Um, at the same time, the EU's highlighted a sort of more social face, if you will, it's, it's uh, president of the commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, has, has talked about a minimum wage uh, throughout the European Union. Now, the research at Oxford, um, the project uh, that, that I'm a part of has actually shown that's a priority for 84% of Europeans. So they, they want a, a sort of Europe with a more social face. They, they support a minimum wage and, and many actually these days also a universal basic income. Uh, now across the, the Atlantic, Joe Biden today just announced that he would also fight for a, a, a minimum wage in the United States. So there's this push towards um, a sort of more social engagement as well. Uh, in the international realm, of course, the, the picture is a bit more mixed. Um, but I'd say again, on, on sort of pushing back against its key rivals, uh, the European Union has capped its, its unity on, on Russia, sometimes with difficulty. And it's also forged uh, slowly, but surely uh, a sort of tougher stance on, on China as well. And I think in addition to that, it's done one thing that's very crucial and where it's maybe special uh, as opposed to, to other powers, it's really harnessed the, its economic power and its regulatory power as, as well at a time when sort of internal and external policies becoming increasingly blurred. 
um, that's of course a, a key factor for the European Union. So I'd say for, for all its shortcomings, the European Union actually does have a good story to tell in some ways, right? Um, and so the, the problem that we're seeing right now with the EU projecting itself may be less about what kind of story does the European Union project and more about how does it tell its story? And here I come back uh, to something that, that I mentioned at the outset and again that we've discussed throughout the series uh, of, of these, these lectures, both identity politics moving to the fore, um, but also social media, new forms of communication and, and the fact that geopolitical competition has spilled over into the, the sort of info war space mean that the, the highlight, the focus today is on a much more emotive form of political communication. Now, again, this is of course nothing, nothing new, um, but I think it, it's being really accelerated and highlighted and amplified by, by these new technologies as well and by the way we, we communicate today. And, and populists have been very good at tapping into that. So they've been uh, incredibly skilled at sort of feeding on this, this pervasive sense of fragility that I referred to and channeling that into feelings of hatred exclusion and fear. And as a result, uh, really a lot of populist movements, even in places where, where they're, oh, can I have an espresso too, please? <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> um, populists have been incredibly uh, good at sort of drawing on this sense of fear and exclusion. And so as a result, even in places where they're not dominating the ballot box, even where they're not really winning at elections, they're totally dominating the public debate. Um, and at the same time, the European Union, and I'd say many liberal democracies as well, in general, have communicated on these issues that I talked about before, uh, the Euro, Brexit, migration in a very rational way. So they've focused on on economic benefits, they focused on statistics, when uh, all of these issues, of course, are incredibly relevant also to people's identity. And, and that there's a very emotive way to, to talk about these issues as well. And I'd say that this, this sort of overly rational way in which the European Union has communicated harms both its a sort of deeper connection to its citizens and also its ability to project itself uh, geopolitically. Um, now, I just want to make one point very clear here, because I think it's, it's important um, when talking about emotions and politics and, and the importance of it and, and the limits of, of facts. Facts and scientific evidence, of course, matter immensely in these times of disinformation, in these times where right now, wherever we look, but maybe across the Atlantic where, you know, the simple act of counting votes in an election is being called fraud, of course it's important to stick to the facts, to tell the truth. Um, that's important for the narrative. That's of course incredibly important also for policy. So good policy and a good uh, political communication needs to rest on facts. Um, the point that I'm making is that it's not simply enough to kind of dump these facts out there onto people in order to make really a convincing political argument you can use, you can appeal to people's rationality, but you should also appeal to their emotions on the basis of this factual information. And in fact, even the science bears this out. So even the science is telling us that science and facts alone are not enough. So a very famous now experiment as early uh, as 1975 in Stanford showed that once people have made up their mind about a certain issue or their identity, uh, it's incredibly hard to change that view by presenting them just with a different forms of information. Um, much more recently, uh, two experts, two health experts have shown in a, in a one, kind of scarily and wonderfully titled uh, book by, by Oxford University Press, um, denying to the grave how, how in the field of, sort of health as well, um, people will reject 
scientific evidence, if they have a certain opinion about something, even if it's their own survival at its stake. Um, for example, the anti-vaccine movement is a very good example, where people make up, they, they have a certain conviction, they make up their minds, they have an opinion, and that will trump any kind of medical evidence that you will give to them, even at the peril of, of being harmed or even losing their own life. So again, even the facts are showing us facts alone aren't enough. Um, and so you mentioned that I, for many years, I, I was a speechwriter and, and communications advisor. And I think one of the things that, that is being disregarded uh, is if I can be a little bit nerdy, is sort of the, the, the sort of basic principles of, of rhetoric by, that go way back to Aristotle. Now, Aristotle talks about the sort of holy triptych, if you will, of um, logos, reason, so reason matters, pathos, emotions, again, I, I spoke uh, about that, and also ethos, so the credibility and legitimacy of the speaker. And um, I think this last factor, of course, draws on these two formal ones, draws on the ability to A, have the facts and the science on your side, but also very crucially on your ability to connect emotionally with your audience and to make uh, them feel that you are relevant, you are legitimate as a speaker and you are relevant to their lives and, and their concerns. And I think what I've seen both in my research, but also in my personal experience is that in the EU, and I'd say in many liberal democracies, uh, but certainly at the EU level, this is even, even more so, the balance in this triptych, if you will, in this, this triangle is tilted very much to the logos to the reason. Uh, so often uh, political leaders will ask you in, in their memos, facts and figures, facts and figures, give us facts and figures. Um, and that, that will only then address you know, one, one side of the story. And to just give one example, I think the, the recent State of the Union by the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, highlights that um, perhaps. So this speech, came at a time that was incredibly important for, for the European Union. This was just after the summer, Europeans had a bit of a reprieve from the pandemic, uh, from the lockdowns, and they came back. And of course, there was a second wave that hit Europe. Um, we're in the throes of that now, you just mentioned the lockdown. Um, there was a great uncertainty about the development of the virus, about the economic consequences of that. Uh, there was uncertainty about the outcome of the US elections. There was certainty that no matter what the outcome, the US would be very focused on itself also in the future. So this was a crucial moment to, to sort of address Europeans and give them a, a perspective of how the European Union would guide them out of this uh, uncertainty and how it would help them to, to withstand all the challenges and pressures that, uh, that the health and the economic crisis would bring. And, and in many ways, the president did, did everything right. So she mentioned climate and she mentioned this more social Europe. And she spoke about, um, sorry, I'm seeing that I'm breaking up. So I'm hoping you, you can understand me. So she mentioned really the top priorities that, that citizens care about, climate, uh, a more social Europe, and also a Europe that will project itself uh, much more powerfully on the global stage. Uh, and yet, as, as many a State of the Union, of course, before that, um, the speeches have found residents mostly in, in expert circles. Um, and in many ways, that's, I would say, a missed opportunity, because, of course, Ursula von der Leyen is not just the president of the European Commission. She's also a trained medical doctor speaking in the midst of a pandemic. She's a mother of seven children, uh, and she's a European citizen that masters many European languages. Um, so she has the ability and the capacity and the, the pathos, if you will, and, and the ethos to, to speak to a much wider audience and to touch them in, in a much deeper way. Uh, and she could have in that speech also shown maybe a, a few more glimpses of the person that's behind the president. And um, now having again, worked in this field and, and having seen how, how European leaders are and have been at the receiving end of, of 
really ceaseless criticism, both from Eurosceptics, but also even national leaders who, of course, are always keen to show any kind of uh, advances on the EU scale as their own um, political victories and any kind of setbacks as the fault of Brussels. Um, I, it, it's probably very understandable that, that European, many European leaders feel reticent about bearing their souls uh, to a wider public and, and sort of showing their, their emotional side, given how much they're subject to criticism. It's, it's much safer, if you will, um, to stick to the hard facts, right? But, um, but it's actually this kind of risk averseness and it's this um, willingness to appear strong and, and faultless that I would argue is the real weakness of the European Union because it, it, it kind of um, subtracts a very powerful way of, of connecting. And of course, some parts of the European institutions have already recognized this need uh, to have also have a more emotional form of communication. So, a couple of examples. I mean, uh, some of you might recall during the European elections, uh, which again was, of course, following after Brexit and, and, and sort of many crises in the European Union, a, a crucial moment. Um, there was a, a video campaign trying to get people out to vote and, and actually being very successful at that, as, as we've seen, that looked at sort of a baby's journey into the life, something that will made maybe many Europeans when you talk about it cringe, but which is incredibly successful, really went viral uh, on the internet. So looking at a, again, a sort of very essential form of communication here. Um, they're also involving, you've mentioned Bono at the outset, they're involving uh, influencers. So people who can speak about the values and the importance of European integration without going into policy details, but by touching a, a wider public and touching them again in, in a different way, sort of more essentially what's, what's on their minds as well. So, so that this is being recognized, but I would say, unfortunately, there is still this sort of quite pervasive risk averseness um, and, and hesitancy to, to communicate uh, differently. Uh, I think another thing that's really essential is that very often communication remains an afterthought. It's something that you do after you've decided something to basically sell political decisions. But I, and again, I think especially in this moment, what we're seeing is of course communication isn't just about selling a product, it's also about paving the way for very wide ranging uh, decisions that need to be taken. Um, it's, it's creating public consent as well, not just following public opinion. And again, in this moment of, of the COVID pandemic, where we've seen that it's necessary to really um, appeal to citizens to make quite drastic changes to their daily lives and, and potentially also uh, uh, adopt policies that um, quite, quite radically change the course of how we run our economies and our societies, of course, that is really essential. And um, I think, the COVID pandemic is also a good example of how this has played out. Uh, if you look at sort of uh, authoritarian governments or, or sort of strongman politics that have tried to appear strong and deny uh, the virus, they've, they've in general fared pretty badly at getting people to, to adopt measures. Whereas those that, that have communicated with more compassion and maybe even on honesty as well, sort of said, we don't really know, but these are the things that we do know and this is what we need you to do. Uh, examples that come to mind are New Zealand, of course, uh, the Prime Minister has been incredibly successful, um, but also Germany in, in the European Union, uh, South Korea or Taiwan in Asia. Um, so governments that have communicated both um, the science, but also with compassion and authenticity, they've really fared very well. In, in tackling this crisis and getting the domestic political support to push through the measures that, that were needed to fight this crisis. I think another good example is the recent US election. Now take Joe Biden, who for many people was seen as quite a flawed candidate and who had to contest in, in a sort of electoral battle that was one of the most visceral political fights I think that we've seen uh, in, in decades, you know? And he, he has actually turned some of the things that were seen as his weakness into his strength. So Joe Biden stutters, right? So um, he has turned, as, as uh, major US newspapers called it, his stutter into a superpower. 
because he has, he spoke about this during the convention and, and it's shown basically his basic humanity, right? He has faults, but even like a, a major hang up, if you're a politician, you really do need to communicate. So if you can't get out a straight sentence, that, that is really a problem, but it, it's a beautiful story of overcoming adversary and, and succeeding that people can identify with and that that's helped him connect to a wider public. Similarly, the loss of his son, um, the tragedy of losing a child uh, for him was also a way to connect to people at a time of pandemic where of course many people were losing their loved ones and, um, and were afraid often about losing their own lives. Um, so to sum up but before we can hopefully start the discussion as well, I'd say that in this very deeply divided and tumultuous world, channeling this need for reassurance that people feel um, it cannot remain an afterthought. It's not a nice sort of add-on, a nice happy touch, um, but it's really a geopolitical imperative. Um, reaching out to citizens and your ability to connect with citizens has geopolitical consequences as well. And I think the, the events of recent years, and again, during the COVID crisis as well, have shown us that outside powers, China and Russia are more than happy to exploit what I call a sort of emotional deficit of EU communication and, and fill it with their own narratives. And, and again, the, the insecurity that surrounds us makes people perceptive to this. Whereas on the other hand, if you reach out with compassion, um, and emotion that can also inoculate people against this kind of disinformation that can build the trust in political decision makers and the institutions that they stand for. And so the European Union should really use this moment to, uh, to connect better, to have more relatable political messages, but also to sort of scale up the way it connects, the way it communicates and, and the tools through which it communicates. It's, um, it's a real opportunity both for connecting to its citizens and again, that in turn will also help it project a more powerful image abroad. And I'd say that the current political mood is actually quite receptive to this. So it's not just fear and hatred that's out there. If we're looking at uh, also here in Europe, sort of the solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. If we're looking again at how many young people uh, Fridays for Future and so on that have come out onto the streets to protest uh, for more action uh, to fight climate change. If we're looking again at the, the minimum uh, wage, universal basic income, there is also a, an incredible thirst here for fairness, for solidarity and for trust among our public. And so I would say that many of you will know the, the old adage that uh, the personal is always political. Um, and I'd say that, you know, in, in order for the European Union to, to win this battle uh, of narratives, the, the political also has to become much more personal if the European Union wants to prevail in this war of words. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, uh, for that uh, in-depth, comprehensive view of, of the issue. Uh, there, there's so much to talk about, and uh, I'll, I'll begin by with, with a few comments and thoughts. And uh, I encourage those of us who are on, on this Zoom call to um, uh, bring in their, their questions and, and comments as, as well. In a sense, we're in a paradoxical situation. Um, there's so much going for Europe and the European Union itself. Um, when uh, Brexit happened and the election of Donald Trump happened, uh, the opinion polls in Europe suddenly had a surge in, in pro-European feeling because people understood that there was a lot to lose, uh, that uh, these two political events that were earth-shattering in a many way, a first-time country leaving the European Union, uh, had people put their finger to their head and said, wait a minute, you know, let's think about what we have here. And, you know, the, the whole panoply of, of things that, that Europe has, uh, that, that 
things that have become second nature to European. Open borders, a common currency, not having to worry about so many things, you know, healthcare and, and all that. Secondly, the fact that migrants mostly want to come to Europe speaks for Europe itself. <laughs> it, it, Europe, Europe sells itself by its existence, by what it has done over the course of time since its inception after, after World War II. And you look at, you have this paradox that you look at, you know, a general survey of public opinions in the member states, you know, by a great majority of countries, people support uh, the fact that they are satisfied with being in the European Union. Now, one, one can say that in many cases, they feel that this is a kind of bulwark, a firewall against their own uh, governments if they go astray on, on a number of issues and sort of the, uh, the European Union is the last insurance that you know, they won't go over the cliff. And yet, uh, as, as uh, we have said, and, and you say, you know, we do have a problem of, of selling Europe, of, of talking about it in these ways. I, I, I like very much your example. Uh, all, all the examples, I think, are extremely pertinent, but the, the State of the Union speech by von der Leyen, and, uh, you know, she, you know, in, in, in maybe a kind of courageous move, she could have done a gesture of throwing the speech uh, uh, behind her back and starting to talk uh, about Europe as, as Ursula, as, as the doctor, as, as, the, um, as the mother, as uh, someone who's lived in various parts of Europe, of, of talking about uni un unity and diversity through her personal story. And probably it would have hit the hearts of, of so many people. Uh, um, in, in, in many, many different ways. You have probably also seen this quote now that's going around uh, since yesterday where Obama, uh, whose book is coming out today, I guess, uh, has talked uh, about this, uh, the decay of truth. And uh, of course, we don't need Obama to tell us. We're witnessing it and you spoke so eloquently about it. The fact that that facts are, are not relevant and that lies and, and fraud and simply the repetition of things that are not true become quote unquote true to so many people. The fact that 70% of Republicans think that there was something wrong with this election, I think is, is uh, you know, scary. It, it shows, goes to show how quickly um, uh, like a bushfire these uh, fraudulent uh, untruths can, can spread, even though we know that the American election and, and many of the Republican officials in the, the US states are saying that everything was basically okay, 99% of it. And so that is one, what one is up against. And without wanting to, to speak for too long, uh, I think it, it's re very revealing, and we've all heard this story that uh, current Prime Minister of the UK, uh, Boris Johnson, was a correspondent in Brussels for the Telegraph. His, his colleague said that he would say that if he doesn't write a negative story about what's going on in Brussels, whether it's bananas or whatever, uh, it will not get published. And what I mean to say by that is that Brussels bashing in many countries has been the easier way than telling the good stories about Europe, which unfortunately in, in media and in tabloid media in particular, the, the good story is not a story. So sort of the, the more negative it is. And that's been the, the kind of headwind, I think, that... Um, the issue that, that you and we are tackling here about how to present Europe has had to deal with over the past 20 years. It's easy simply to scapegoat Brussels and you know, present it as, as some people in Eastern Europe have as the new Moscow, as the one who wants to impose something. You know, how, how would you reflect on this paradox? And you have obviously, but may, maybe a few more words, you know, that, that Europe, is this great story, has so many stories to tell. We are, we're witnessing it every day by people voting with their feet to come into Europe because it's a good place. And on the other hand, the, this fact that, that we have difficulty to, to talk about it. 
Well, thank you so much, Ivan. And then I'm glad that um, my remarks have sort of sparked such a wealth of, of reflections also from, from your part. And of course, you're, um, in a way, you already answered your, your own question, right? You, you highlighted three things that are really crucial that, um, that make this, this paradox, make it a, on one hand such a, such a crucial issue, but also such a paradoxical one to, to address. Um, the first one is a very basic principle, not just of European integration or politics, but of life, if you will, which is, you know, you don't know what you've got until it's gone, right? This is always how things work. Unless something is really threatened, you, you take things for granted when they work, uh, whether that's people or political institutions. Um, and, and of course, in a way, that's also what we've seen through the course of European integration, right? Europe has always kind of made a major jump in its integration process in the political competencies that it was given by member states as a reaction to a major crisis. So in a way, Europeans have, have actually not wasted their, their crises. They say never waste a good crisis. And I think this is also why partly uh, why it's so important to act now, of course. So I think that's, that's the first thing. Something needs to be, if things just work, then you don't pay attention um, to them. If they're, if they're being threatened, if you're worried about losing them, that's when you pay attention. Um, that, that's the first point. Um, I think there, the, the challenge is then just to keep people's uh, political attention on it. But of course, also, if it's not threatened, then you don't really have a problem. As I said, then you maybe don't need the narrative so much. So uh, as long as you don't waste the crisis, that, that can be fine. You need to use the crisis then to also make your case and, and use people's, and that's what I'm saying now, people are perceptive to actually hear about that. So you mentioned uh, Brexit and so on. I mean, people went into the streets, even in London, um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second paradox, uh, and a huge challenge, and not just for European uh, integration or, or the European Union, I think for, for democracies uh, much more broadly, and really, frankly, for society is, of course, uh, what you said about the, the decay of truth and, and sort of the, the Obama quote you just gave, but of course something we've, we've been talking about a lot in communication circles, but right now also more and more in, in, in sort of political circles, that's a, that's a huge challenge. Um, that, and, and again, something that's being really amplified, of course, political propaganda is nothing new. This is age old, right? So that people uh, use misinformation and, and sort of reinterpret or interpret history and, and politics in their own ways. It's absolutely nothing new. This is as old as politics as well. That's a basic challenge of politics. But the fact that you now have modern forms of communication, uh, social media that amplify in ways that, that are, you know, were unimaginable even just a few years ago, and that it's so difficult now to, to sort of tell um, the real from the fake, so you can now sort of talked a lot about deep fakes, you can fake video evidence and so on. And of course, the much bigger chances doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be true if it's an opinion. And again, I've, I've talked a little bit about how, uh, how that also works in other fields beyond politics. It's really hard to, to change people's minds with, with facts. So, um, so that's why I think emotions are so important. Um, and, and we've really seen this challenge amplified. And um, I guess uh, the, the third challenge is um, the third sort of paradox as well is um, how, how do you talk about something that's sort of functional and rational in, in the sort of more emotive way? Why, why should you uh, at a time when you're being threatened personally, if you will, make yourself even more vulnerable, right? Um, to, to kind of address a certain challenge. But um, I think again, like the science bears this out, that this is something that's, that's really crucially important, but it's, it's something that in some ways is also 
contradictory. We see this in the, the sort of talking about interdependence, right? We see in all the political challenges that we're uh, facing, climate change, even this pandemic, of course, it makes sense. It's logical to reach out to others, but your personal instinct when you're threatened is to turn in on yourself and to sort of go it alone and, and think of yourself first. So I think that's a paradox also for Europeans to to overcome and it's you know it's an ongoing challenge and it's a, it's not something that can be resolved i don't think it will be the, the important is to uh to to use these challenges to really forge more effective solutions which will always be flawed you know just as, as the old sort of adage goes about democracy i mean it's an essentially flawed system it's just the least flawed and i think there the europeans can also be more honest and authentic also when they're talking to other people just to own up their own weaknesses um but also showing that this is actually at the end of the day the best solution and, and sort of reach out with humility and show why uh, at the end of the day they have uh, not just good answers or a good political spin, but actually also effective policy solutions to address these challenges. Great. Okay, we have uh, uh, lots to say. Um, I will not use my uh, privilege as the moderator here. Uh, the first question comes from uh, our last year's fellow, Isabel Ioannidis, uh, who says, I'm wondering whether one of the reasons the EU doesn't manage to get its message across is that it is constantly on the defensive. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the institutions focus on facts, but they also focus on issues that concern the elites rather than the masses and adopt a didactic approach where people feel they are being told rather than spoken to. Look, for example, as the way, at the way we speak at the Balkans. This is a region we still seem to speak to as if they were still in the early 2000s. Yet, there are so many young educated people in the region. Some have masters and I would add PhDs in European studies, studied in Europe, have worked for so many on, and so, on so many European projects. They may not be part of Europe yet or the European Union, but they know much about the functioning of the European Union. Similarly, in recent years, EU citizens have been directly touched by the mistakes that the EU has done. For example, the handling of the financial crisis. But the EU doesn't seem to recognize its mistakes, perhaps because it is on the defensive. So beyond the populism, sorry, I can't see uh, the rest of the question, Dino. Okay, should I maybe start? I think there's already yeah. a lot there, so maybe yeah. uh, maybe I can already start. Um, first of all, I can't see you, Isabel, but it's I've got you in my mind's eye, and, and it's wonderful <laughs> that you're here. And thanks so much um, for this question, which uh, I think is incredibly important, and um, maybe touches sort of on the on the very last thing that I just said in, in reply to Ivan's comments, which is this need to sort of show also humility and and um, uh, empathy. And I think you are so right that, that there's a real risk, again, amongst political elites in the European Union, but I think more, more broadly, uh, anywhere probably, but, but especially also in democracies, which makes it so problematic, is to really talk down to people. Um, uh, it's really a big part of, of the, the reflections in the Democratic Party in, in the United States right now. Uh, same thing, that people felt that <laughs> Donald Trump, of all people, managed to present him, you know, mogul, property mogul in, in New York, managed to portray himself as like the man of the people because so many citizens were felt that they were being talked down to. Uh, you mentioned, of course, the, the Balkans, where, where emotions are forever boiling high, you know, and where there's the least uh, kind of people that you want to be talked down to. And yet somehow, the European Union has, has inadvertently maybe uh, um, done this. Uh, I, I worked a lot for many, many years in the field of foreign policy, where we always said, you know, we, we need to connect better to Brazil, to, to Africa. They all share, you know, so many, the, the young people of Africa share our goals. They want innovation, they want democracy, they want freedoms. Uh, India is the biggest democracy in the world. We need to work more closely with them. And yet somehow the European Union has been very, very slow to recognize its, its 
colonial heritage, for example, and hasn't really seen that, the, for better or worse, it's often had a tendency, again, partly maybe uh, uh, sort of consciously, a, a lot of the times, I think also unconsciously, given this appearance of talking down to people. And I think that's, that's really incredibly dangerous. And again, especially, of course, in a democracy, uh, we've talked about Brexit. I mean, many of you will remember, um, I was here, I was working here in Brussels, the aftermath of the referendum. And of course, all of us that, that sort of care about that European integration and that care about the United Kingdom, I myself grew up there, uh, were shocked by, by the results and, and even maybe not so surprised though as well. Um, but a lot of the, so one of the stories that, that really made the rounds is like, oh my God, you know, have you seen like all these people Googling what is the EU on the day after, after the referendum, right? You might remember. And, and I was quite, so, yeah, shocked even. I would say that, that so many people were, were saying like, oh my God, how stupid can you be? You know, how stupid these people that are Googling now, you know, now that they've voted, now that they've poured disaster on us, they're Googling this. And I just thought like, hang on there. I mean, maybe that's, you know, not the cleverest thing. Maybe you should have Googled. But also what is the fault of democracies itself? Uh, and, you know, if people don't know about the European Union, that's also our fault, right? That's also, we need to communicate better about who we are. And if people need to Google that, that's a problem. That's not just because people are stupid because it's also our duty. Uh, and again, in democracies, you know, as, as democratic uh, politicians and elites, it's your responsibility to make sure that you convince the people. And if you can't convince the people, the fault lies not with the people, guess what? But the fault lies with you if you're in a democracy. And I think that's really a, a sort of strand of the thought. You can tell I feel quite passionately about this, but I think this is something that political elites and all across democracies really need to remember that um, it's really tough for all the reasons that we just discussed, uh, Ivan, with your comments. It's hard, but you've got to do your job to convince people. And again, that's why I think you need to increase uh, your, your panoply of, of ways of connecting with people. That's why I talk about emotions, but that's uh, talking down to people will really absolutely, totally not do, not your own citizens and not foreign powers. Everybody knows this basic psychology one-on-one, -on -one, you know, don't talk down to someone if you want to convince them of something. Yeah, absolutely. And and just to mention again, I'm I'm very glad that you mentioned the, the European elections for the European Parliament. I think that was a, a very good example of where uh, a level of mobilization that we hadn't seen, uh, sort of probably the greatest turnout that, that there has been in Europe for a European parliamentary election and, and simply the awareness that there were high stakes uh, this time around. I mean, we, we know the result, we know what happened. But I think th there was an understanding that people had to get out there. And so you're right. I, I completely agree that the, the need for, for leadership on European issues, although we know that all politics are local and that elections are won in, in sort of member state parliamentary elections. But if, if we are serious about the future of Europe and Europe currently, there has to be a part where there is uh, an explaining and, and a narrative by the national leaders on, on the importance for them. And we know the, the picture has been sketchy on that. And again, Brexit, I think, is an excellent example. Okay, we go to Mirjana Tomic, who has the, the following question. Thank you so much for your most interesting presentation, Julia. As a communications professional, you know that it is very important to know your audience. Emotions in communication are important, but how well do EU employees in Brussels know the world views of different EU citizens. How many different emotional messages have to be crafted in order to reach diverse audiences? Or do you think that one can rely on one message for all? The good examples of positive communication you provided were all confined to one country. How can a multilateral organization craft a personal message? Or in other words, you know, do we need to tailor make the narrative for the different member states or the different regions of Europe? I think we do, yes. Thanks so much for, for that question. I think it's really 
um, a crucial one, and of course, uh, one that I dealt with very, very practically uh, as a speechwriter in the realm of foreign policy, right? So where the audience was by definition always a different country and always a foreign country as well. And this, this challenge of knowing your audience has been crucial. But again, it, it depends, I mean, it's, it's true also for, for a speechwriter for a major company or something, even if you just go from one. Um, so you always need to tailor make um, your narrative. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have one coherent overall narrative. So I think that's important. I think that's maybe also uh, important for the European Union to have that down a bit more clearly. Uh, I, I spoke about what some of the elements of this narrative could be, um, and, and frankly already are as well. But again, I think there are, there is a good basis there for telling the story already. Um, but it is, of course, a huge challenge, as, as you very rightly highlight, uh, to, to speak to so many different member states. And then, of course, within the member states, also different social strata, different political leanings, uh, and so on. So, so this, is, this is tough. Um, but I think, again, the, the challenge can also be turned into an opportunity. I mean, we have, uh, even though they're supposed to leave their passport at, at the door once they take their jobs, we have commissioners from um, pretty much every member of stage, right? They all have communications advisors and speechwriters that usually come from the same country as, as their political principal. So we have an antenna into the different member states. Um, I think, yeah, we, we probably have a tendency, uh, and, and there I'll be very self-critical uh, for the time that, that I did my job as well, to look at maybe three or four mainstream media mostly. Uh, I think, again, that's maybe why, uh, and this has been discussed, you know, up and down and up and down, not just in, in Brussels circles, but again, in, in all sort of political circles. How did we miss Brexit? How did we miss Trump? Again, even now. You know, the second time round, even if Biden won, you know, how did we miss how much support he still has? We have a tendency to focus uh, and, and to stay in sort of our communication silos. So that's really important, breaking up the silos. It's important who communicates as well. I, I touched upon that briefly. It can't... Um, Bureaucrats are, are maybe not the best people to, you know, bring the narrative out there. It's, it's important that a good narrative is being forged at the Brussels level. But at the end of the day, it will be community workers, it will be local mayors, it will be NGOs, it will be rock stars maybe, or artists um, that have to carry this narrative out there. And they can then also, again, tailor make that, that message. I think um, having different uh, people communicate um, at different levels is, is really crucial in confronting that, that, uh, that challenge. Um, but I think we do have the means, as I said, to have that and to do that. I think we probably do need a bit more self-awareness at the top level of how uh, blinkered we often still are in terms of what we think is the public opinion that we talk too often to like-minded people um, I think it's a challenge to be honest also now in this age of zoom in one on one hand it's wonderful that we all can still connect via by a computer and so on but I think it kind of reinforces this bubble mentality as well because it's much harder to get out of your bubble to connect beyond that but you have to go beyond your comfort zone as well reaching out to, to audiences that uh, you sometimes might find difficult to understand um, so that is something that also uh, that again I, I mentioned social media and so on there are, we now have means to do proper audience analysis and so on this is not being done enough uh, again, not a challenge just for the European Union in general. Uh, we need to become much more professional about looking at our, who are our audiences, how do we speak to them, and how do we reach them. Uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, extremely important to, to tackle that, that issue. May, may I just add that our uh, first year fellow, Piotr Buras, who uh, heads the ECFR, European Council on Foreign Relations Office in Warsaw, uh, partly worked, worked on that issue. How, how does uh, part of civil society or individuals who are engaged in their own countries, in this case, Poland, how do they craft a, a tailor-made message on, on Europe and its benefits for, for their own uh, audience? So it sort of goes both ways. I mean, obviously Brussels is very important 
in crafting a message, but I think as, as you mentioned that there are various levels, obviously leadership, but then uh, the message from above also has to be met by a message from below and have people engaged to, you know, one counter the falsehoods that are being presented out there, but also uh, seek those examples and those stories that, that can attract people. Okay, our next question um, is, is pertinent to, to what is going on today. Uh, and it says, who is bluffing right now regarding the EU budget? Is it Hungary and Poland or actually Germans with their rule of law conditionality? And if I can pepper it further, uh, Julia, uh, we not only have this issue now on, on rule of law and you know, how do we defend the values of Europe in, in a delicate situation as the budget is being prepared, but we also have this very unfortunate situation between a member state called Bulgaria and an aspiring member state called North Macedonia, where it seems to fly in, in the face of, of all what uh, a member state stands for, unity and diversity, while trying to block on purely identity issues um, a country. So in terms of, of you know, your, your subject today, how, how do these two things look to you? Well, they're a, they're a huge challenge. And I mean, I think these are just, just two examples. And again, coming from the field of a foreign policy, that's of course a sort of always a, a basic dilemma. Well, there are two dilemmas here. Um, one is how much do you stick up for basic principles uh, and how much are you pragmatic in kind of who you work with and when do you give in and when do you loosen those principles for uh, the, the pure aim of getting a deal done, whether that's amongst member states now or whether that's with a foreign power. Uh, I'll mention the Turkey deal on, on migration and so on. I mean, that's a perennial dilemma in policymaking and in, in foreign policymaking in particular, because you're always going to have to deal with sort of unsavory partners, if you will. But you also have to think about how do you actually get results and what will they then bring? Uh, in terms of serving those principles that you're trying to defend in, in the first place. And I think it's a really, really tough uh, and, and sort of difficult line to, to tread. It's really a tightrope walk very often. You know, how much do you stick up for your principles uh, and how much do you, do you give in? Um, that, that's the first dilemma. I think um, certainly if you don't have that, that kind of, unity around certain principles. Now you mentioned, uh, we talked about the budget, Poland and Hungary, but of course it's not just the budget um, in general, yeah, rule of law principles. If, if you make your political project, if you make your narrative about defending democracy and defending uh, individual freedoms, and then you have two members uh, that, that do not uh, sort of stick up for those principles, you have a huge issue, there's a without question. Uh, and, and that's that's a real problem. Uh, and so these kind of divisions, and uh, that's a real problem for the people of Poland and Hungary as well, by the way. Um, so that's not just a narrative problem there. Um, that That's fundamental. And that, that's not, I wish I had the solutions, but I think that there it's, it's, it really harms also the credibility of the European Union. And to come back to, to Isabel's question about sort of being talked down to, this is certainly something that foreign powers do not receive very well to being sort of preached about these standards of their feeling that this is not something that people are being uh, sort of being upheld within Europe as well. So that's that's a, a big dilemma, and there should you know it, it's something that the European Union needs to grapple with and probably stand up much more so. I think the other dilemma there is, of course, that people who, again, in democracies and people vote for, for unsavory political leaders as well, and preaching from Brussels will, will not change their minds as well. So democratic change also needs to come from home. So, so again, it's, it's a tough, I wish I had the political solutions, but it's really a, a much more complex political dilemma. I think also to just say, oh, the European Union is too weak on this or that, or they should really beat the Hungarians over the head, um, that's not necessarily 
we've talked about the Balkans a lot, you know, simply mentioning like you need to change your, your rule of law procedures or your criminal investigation, that's not going to help either. So, so it's, it's much more complex, much more difficult um, than that, but it's, it's a huge, uh, huge issue. Um, and so that's something that will remain, I think, also with the union of so many member states and, and in this political climate that we've uh, talked about and where outside powers, again, are, are really interfering in our, in our domestic affairs. That's something that's going to stick with us. And that's, of course, going to be a major holdup. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, Volodymyr Kulik who says the following, well, while I agree with your point about the importance of emotional appeal, I also see a danger in it. The states uh, and the EU's ability to ensure most citizens' adherence to the prescribed ways of behavior has been based on what uh, Michel Foucault called the regime of truth. Namely, the dominant regime of truth was the result of joint effort of many institutions, including academia, education, bureaucracy, and the media, the latter being in particular important as a gatekeeper regulating what people could know and thus a chance to believe. But people cannot bypass this gate, gate peeper, uh, gatekeeper and challenge the established producers of truth. If we highlight emotional appeal, as a way of ensuring compliance, we are in a sense admitting that the established regime of truth is no longer unquestionably valid. Do you think this will do more harm than good? Hey, thanks a lot. No, I think this is uh, um, what I was really highlighting in, in, in the lecture is that you need both and you need to combine them. And I think, again, you can't substitute just emotions for, for facts. And, and I mean, you mentioned uh, um, politics, the media and so on. They, they've always drawn on emotions. Of course, there's not nothing new, you know, this is, uh, again, sort of part of the ascent. Look at the media. Even you mentioned that, you know, this idea of bad news cells. Um, I mentioned the, uh, um, the European uh, Union video for the for the elections of um, of a baby coming into uh, into the world, but of course many of you will remember what really swayed the debate um, in in the migration crisis was a photo of, of this little boy washed up on the shores. You know, so so of course emotions already matter in the way that we communicate. What I'm saying is that what well, we shouldn't leave this field to to the populace. I don't think there is a dichotomy that, that you're posing. I don't think that's that's uh, there isn't necessarily this tension. I think it's it's actually falsely perceived as an either or, and um, and I at least the point I was trying to make is that you can draw on emotions, and I think again. Uh, we mentioned Obama earlier, he has done this very effectively. He has shown um, President Macron as well, to a degree you can, you can mobilize emotions also for, for positive uh, uh, goals. And, and I think it's, it's the combining both. And uh, this is not just true for politics. This is again, sort of how you, how you forge an effective uh, argument, even interpersonally. You have to appeal to both, to people's reasons and their emotions at the same time. Indeed, and uh, I think that you mentioning Macron, I think it's, it's very good. He did win that famous presidential election in 2017, both on an, a note of optimism and a note of pro-Europe, and, and it worked. Uh, many people were totally in, in a doom and gloom situation. Those of us who know France a little bit uh, sort of had confidence that, that it would work. Uh, and it worked. So again, I think it's uh, the, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. And uh, and Obama's, of course, two victories in 2008 and 12 again uh, are uh, you know the the audacity of hope in a sense. So uh, I don't I don't think anything is lost. And I think that that the doom and gloomers sort of had had a heyday, uh, and so it's somewhat waning. Thank God. Uh, not that we need to be rosy-eyed on the contrary. I think we need to be extremely realistic about the situation. But okay, on to the next question from Susan Perkins, who says, as a UK citizen and passionate anti-Brexiteer, I unfortunately couldn't vote in the 2016 referendum as I have been living abroad in Austria for over 15 years. 
How can one convince the people who voted for Brexit that the EU is not about control, but about togetherness, as is embodied in the word union? Maybe the EU should put across this part of its image more strongly in order to show that it is an attempt to solve problems together rather than to enforce rules and regulations. Togetherness, as is embodied in the word union, Maybe the EU should put across this part of its image more strongly in order to show that it is an attempt to solve problems together rather than to enforce rules and regulations. I'm sure you've been confronted with this on a daily basis, Julia, in your work. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I could talk for another couple of hours. I already mentioned I, I, I grew up in the UK. I also was educated in, in the UK. So this is a, a and, and I was working for the European Union as a communicator during the time of Brexit. So this hits home in, on so many levels. Um, and uh, what could we have done? What should we have done? Uh, what shouldn't we have done? Um, I think that this, this theme of togetherness, of course, is, is important. And that's also something um, that is, is now very much uh, a part of the European narrative. It could have probably hi been highlighted more um, I think one of the big challenges was, of course, that at the time we were actually being asked pretty much explicitly by Prime Minister Cameron, you Europeans, you shush, you know, certainly the Brussels elite, don't you dare go out and make good arguments for why the EU matters, because these people, they all hate your guts. So it doesn't really matter what you say, they're just going to hate this even more. So to let me handle this on my home turf. And, you know, maybe that's, um, so, so maybe that was a mistake and maybe, maybe yeah, the, the EU should have been more vociferous it, itself, also ahead of the referendum. I think one thing that I've been working on a lot and thinking on a lot, uh, and that sort of connects also to my own personal history is of course, again, a basic in communication, not just for political communications, you highlight Britain's role for this European Union, of course, the, the, the UK has been incredibly influential, in many ways, punched above its weight, certainly in my field, again, in, in foreign policy, uh, um, the foreign office is, you know, leading diplomatic service in, in Europe, we were incredibly uh, worried and, and sad to see uh, the UK go and all that expertise is so showing people why they matter. Um, don't call them sort of, you know, ignorant bigots, um, but, but show them why, why they're so important. Show them, yes, show maybe not just togetherness as a kind of kumbaya message of uh, why we all need to love each other now at times of crisis and, and need to huddle, but maybe also showing how, how togetherness actually works, you know, how it gets things done. Um, but again, also, yeah, maybe appealing to the sense uh, uh, I, I think what was paradoxical about Brexit, what maybe people thought, and when again we see the limits of sort of rational communication, economic uh, communication, is that, uh, of course, many regions that were receiving a lot of EU uh, funds actually voted for Brexit. So there wasn't a pragmatic um, argument behind it. It was more about identity. It was what you were saying. This, I think this loss of control is a huge issue. And I think people misunderstood that. And again, that's something that was quite emotionally driven, uh, where, where there's so many social changes and political changes that have very little to do with, with the EU itself, but where, where people were just looking for a scapegoat and, and the European Union and having that referendum uh, was a very welcome scapegoat. So again, tailoring your message, understanding your audience much better, validating uh, the things that, that are good that the UK did. Uh, and, and for those people who have, you know, uh, so from a liberal democratic point of view, more unsavory views, you know, dismissing their, their, their arguments maybe, but, but understanding the problems that, that, and understanding the fears that are driving uh, the, the kind of exclusionary politics. I think that's, that's really crucial and speaking to those fears and, and finding different ways of, of channeling them. I think that's really been one of the problems that the naysayers on Europe have pushed this message that somehow we are all being put in, into a Brussels straitjacket where we will lose our soul, our identity, our religion, and that we won't be who we have been until now. 
I like to say to that, you know, the French are no less French than they were when they joined or the Brits before they exited or the Italians, uh, you know, everyone keeps their national characteristics and the rest, but it is as Susan rightly put it about resolving and addressing challenges in the world together because each individual country cannot do it by itself, whether it's climate or migration or, or anything else. Uh, I move to, to the next question from... Sorry, before you do so, can I just... Uh, sure. Quick on that because I think we've, and we talked about France before and, and Macron and his success, and I think that there, since you just mentioned it again, and I think it speaks to the Brexit narrative as well, is how, and we have done this actually, uh, also in, in EU foreign policy, and then my principles is one of the messages, is also to show how, I mean, togetherness is wonderful, but also how you can advance actually national aims on the European scale. So A, of course, it's economies of scales. If you're more, you are tougher, you are bigger, you are stronger in a sort of global competition, but also you can use the European stage. You can use it as a platform. And again, the UK has actually been very good at that. I mean, look exactly. at enlargement, right? I mean, it's kind of managed to really push it's, it's political principles and have them adopted by a wide range of other countries. So it's, a, it's an amplifier of your national interest, if you will. And, and since we spoke about France, I think they have done this, la, la, la grande nation, but in European, right? They've been very effective at many precedents. And I think that what, what made Macron so effective is that on one hand, as you said, he was pro-European. Um, he had a message of hope um, and, and he sort of, uh, but he also channeled something that's very particularly French, which is the sort of, you know, revolutionary spirit and resistance, because of course, he on one hand, he was defending the European establishment and working together. Uh, and, and he stands for that, you know, he was working for, for a bank before and so on. But on the other hand, he was also totally appending the, the French uh, party, political party system. So there was this revolutionary spirit tied to established goals and principles that, that really made it work. And I think that's again about tailoring your message, tailoring it to your audience, tailoring it to the, the member state and the national political culture that you're in. That is also crucial. And that's of course, partly the responsibility of European leaders, but of course also national leaders and, um, and how successful they are at, at doing that. Absolutely. Okay, uh, from uh, our fellow um, Europe Futures fellow, Sergeant Svich, uh, to build on the question on Bulgaria's kidnapping of the EU accession process in the case of North Macedonia, previous decades long experience with the Greek veto. If you were to write the speech for von der Leyen, how would you explain this decision to the people of North Macedonia? <laughs> Fortunately, you don't have to. <laughs> so it's a hypothetical, Julia. Well, yeah, I'm glad. Out of one, of one of the reasons I'm glad to be out of my previous job. Um, I don't know. Um, I think it, it's really hard. I guess you have to fall back on sort of basic diplomacy and speak to both sides there. I mean, it's not, uh, yeah, you say we, we've had this in the case of, of, um, of other member states as well. Um, I, I'm not sure there's a, there's a, Good, yeah, maybe explanation, yes, is, is to go back on, on histories to understand your audience, to, to show this, but also then to own up the, the problems that, that you see with that, which of course uh, very, very problematic. I think that's maybe also a field where um, diplomacy and one-on-one and, -on -one and non-public communication is really of the essence as well, where, uh, which of course is the basis for them later having a good narrative and speaking publicly is often, and I, I worked for, for Kathy Ashton at the time of the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue, uh, and, and which led you know, to a historic agreement, but of course that meant for, for, for a long time not to speak so much publicly, but by bringing people to Brussels where they could talk away from everybody else between themselves. Um, uh, when, when antagonisms are so deeply seated, it's, uh, I think it's also sometimes important to find a space um, to, to talk about these things away from, from the public and to, to kind of try and loosen these age old uh, um, sort of, yeah, 
um, antagonisms and, and uh, work on that before you can really uh, have this message of togetherness, if you will, which simply just won't, won't fly in that context. Yeah, I, I think, uh, to, to put it very briefly, I think we have the very unfortunate circumstance in which domestic politics uh, gets embroiled into a, a European issue for the sake of keeping a, a governing coalition and staying in, in power, one then panders to the kind of uh, most right-wing part of that coalition. Um, I, I'm hopeful that there will be a, a resolution at some point once that kind of domestic political dimension is, is satisfied. Of course, one can't be assured completely, but it is uh, this strange situation where Bulgaria is one of the neighboring member states of the Western Balkans, is one of the most proactive, uh, pro-accession, pro-enlargement countries, suddenly then flips completely in, into this uh, very unwarranted for uh, situation. But uh, as you say, I mean, and th this is the difficulty, uh, this is the, the kind of difficult part of the European Union where member states can do things like this. Um, and it does, uh, it is detrimental to the image of Europe and thus to the narrative of Europe. But that's the reality that we live in. We have an interesting question here from uh, Dan Vuletic who uh, greets, uh, greets you and uh, says that he is a history, um, uh, I'm a history of, uh, he probably works on the history of contemporary Europe based, he's based here at the research center on historical transformation at the University of Vienna uh, and was also an IWM fellow. Uh, Dan says, I'm the author of uh, a book called Post-War Europe and the Eurovision Song Contest, in which I examine how the development of the contest has been intertwined with the politics of post-war Europe. Earlier this year, I spoke with the EU Commissioner for promoting our European way of life, Margarita Schinas, who said that there are only two cultural references that really unite Europeans, the Champions League, football, and the Eurovision Song Contest. In researching for my book, I discovered a similar opinion opinion being presented by the European Commissioner for Culture in the late 80s. So in some ways, not much seems to have changed in 30 or so years, despite the EU's significant investments in financial and technological resources into cultural politics. What do you think, your, why, why do you think Eurovision and UEFA do successfully uh, that the EU does not? Well, first of all, thanks a lot for that question. And, and I think it's a, it's a fascinating field of research. And of course, there's also a lot of uh, very interesting research going into voting patterns uh, during the European uh, Eurovision Song Contest. And I guess many of you who will have watched it have seen it, how different countries vote with others, not on the basis of the quality of the song, but their political allegiance or their, their cultural allegiance for, for that matters. Um, but I think it's, it's partly what you're saying is, is uh, an illustration of, of my argument, right? Is to say that sort of culture and feelings and, and emotions, and of course sports, I mean, what better sport than football, you know, where emotions sort of boil high and, and music as well, which sort of, you know, makes your heart sing, and captures people's imaginations in a way that maybe dry, uh, boring uh, uh, bureaucrats ca cannot. So I think that's again um, a a an illustration of sort of saying you need to uh, you need different dimensions. I think one of the things that that have evolved, where I'd say, is a really positive example um, beyond what you say is, is something that's often cited as well, but that's really changed uh, entire generations already is of course um, Erasmus and sort of people traveling around Europe and, and, and uh, studying in, in different countries. I think that has changed uh, since, since the 80s, since you said nothing, nothing has changed. I think we do have now um, a new generation that has benefited so much from, from being exposed to these, these different cultures as well. And that's, I think, something that, that's so beautiful and that many people do appreciate about the European Union, that there is a sort of common sense of being European and what it means to be European, but also um, very different ways of, of maybe living the sort of core principles that, that we all share. And um, 
Yeah, I think music and sports are, are hugely important, which is why we've talked about Bono and which is why we've talked about sort of influences and sports stars. Footballers have been incredibly influential in talking um, about the European Union. We had at the, the Munich Security Conference, you know, that sort of mecca of the sort of foreign policy elite. You don't really get more um, sort of removed from, from the, the broader public than, than that. Um, football was sort of making an argument there about, um, about European integration and the need to, again, the message of, of togetherness that Susan mentioned. So um, yeah, I think these, these things are uh, essential and, um, and it's, it, you know, at the end of the day, good policy making has, has boring, and I, I know that by personal experience and drudgery elements, you know, no one wants to be there when the sausage gets, gets made, but of course we all want the, the tasty sausage at the end. So um, you need to combine these things that they'll always be a part of European policy making as well that is gray and boring and technocratic and slow. And guess what? That's really important that you get good policy as well. So I think rather than having, again, this dichotomy, we can then rely and, and draw on the culture and the beauty and the music and the football to communicate uh, the benefits of that drudgery and, and gray and slow process. Uh, Julia, before I say do's point, uh, can I put you on the spot and uh, ask you to share a story from your days uh, in, in the role of a senior advisor and a speechwriter uh, that sort of sticks with you uh, now that you are at, at least temporarily not anymore in, in, the, in the EU tower in Brussels? Oh God, there's so many stories. Um, maybe just one uh, that, that kind of led me to this kind of research because it was a... Um, Actually, it's happened twice, uh, and, and it's, it's sort of putting myself on the spot in sort of my own failures, maybe as a as a speechwriter, that the challenges that we had. But is is really my um, my former boss Federica Mogherini, um, who, as as many of you may know, was a sort of surprise candidate as well for the post of, of high representative of the European Union. She was the Italian foreign minister before. She was a woman. She was young. Not that many people knew her. Um, she received, and as many, unfortunately, still women do in, in the, especially this field of diplomacy, still she, she received quite a lot of pushback uh, or at least raised eyebrows, let's say, uh, why she, she got this role. And so she was giving a speech at the, the Munich Security Conference that I just mentioned. So again, the sort of room full of, uh, you know, German army officials, basically, mostly, no offense, um, um, sort of aging white men uh, uh, deliberating, you know, the ups and downs of, of, of security policy. And here she was, and this was one of her first speeches really in, in that role, coming out to talk about the EU, no less, you know, the European Union, um, and her, their role in foreign policy. So already quite a challenge, and then also her, her person. So we wrote her this, this speech, and, and at the time, I was working together with Natalie Tocci, who was working, uh, leading the work on the EU global strategy. So we were working a lot on the sort of EU's narrative as well, uh, foreign policy strategy. We kind of ticked all the boxes, a bit like the example that I just gave of the State of the Union, you know, mention all of the good points and the strategy and why the EU matters. And, and she did all that, but what she did beforehand was to sort of talk a little bit about her time when she was a young girl and how she looked at Europe. And at least for me, I found it really touching. I could see how the room was sort of packing up. And I think what she did very effectively, she turned that image that, that people were trying to turn against her, the sort of young woman, you know, by, by talking about herself as a little girl. So she played with the prejudice that people had against her and it actually made them listen to her. And that's something that she did personally. That's not something I could have written into her speech um, because I, I didn't know that anecdote. So that's, I think, also why the personally connecting um, to your audience, but maybe also taking a risk, because that was a real example of risk taking. Again, here were all these, you know, officers. Um, they were already 
criticizing her for who she is. And she kind of underlined and, and highlighted who she is, her own vulnerability, and it really worked for her. And that's, you know, sort of um, a, a decade later, it kind of led me to, to, to this kind of research that I'm doing now. Well, it goes to show once again, the importance of telling our own stories as ways in which we can touch people and have them understand uh, what we believe in and what you know what we feel our mission is in in positions like that and not not only in positions like that but julia definitely does point thank you very much for your presentation and uh, the great great uh, reactions that we have from from our audience thank you to all those who asked questions uh, this is a, a work in progress uh, all our fellows have now presented uh, in the virtual COVID-19 world that we're living, we'll find ways to have our fellows be present uh, over the next month uh, during this fellowship. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll keep you informed. Uh, thanks to Dina Pashalic, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, project manager here, who uh, helps us uh, be present uh, in the virtual world. And... Uh, uh, until very soon and as i said we'll let you know when when our next meeting is julia thank you so much once again thanks to you and thanks to everybody for the excellent questions and, and comments okay bye-bye to all